Welcome to Crime, Corruption, and Cocktails, the true crime podcast where we look at cases of corruption and negligence and examine their historical and cultural implications. Today, I'm drinking a hard cider with a shot of fireball, getting a little spicy. Uh, What do you have, Del? I am drinking a margarita, and on this week's episode, we're going to look at a case that exemplifies the issues surrounding racial profiling and solitary confinement. Khalif Browder's case highlights the issues that arise when one person's life is thrown into chaos from outside corruptive forces. Khalif Browder was born into foster care when at birth, Child Protective Services removed him from his mother's care due to her drug addiction. He was raised by his adoptive mother, Vanita Browder, on Prospect Street near the Bronx Zoo. His teachers described him as a fun student. Browder's negative interactions with the police started young when he was arrested for third-degree larceny. Police testified that he had crashed a stolen bakery truck into a sanitation car while joyriding. He pled guilty, though later he stated he was just a bystander. Eventually, he registered as a youthful offender and was placed on probation. On May 15th, 2010, the police arrested Browder and his friend during a stop and frisk. This was a common practice by New York City police officers, and Browder had experienced this numerous times prior. In reality, the police were responding to a 911 call made by Roberto Batista, who said, quote, two male black guys, they took my brother's book bag, end quote. Browder told the attending police officers, quote, I didn't rob anyone. You can check my pockets, end quote. The police searched Browder and did not find the backpack. Batista was sitting in the back seat of the police car and identified Browder and his friend as the thieves. Batista gave conflicting accounts of the robbery. Batista's testimony of the date of the theft varied between interviews as well as other aspects of his story. At first, Batista implied that the robbery occurred the night of the 911 call, but when questioned by officers at the scene, he stated that the robbery had occurred two weeks prior. At the scene, Batista also implied after questioning that someone had merely tried to rob him and may not have succeeded. Furthermore, on the initial police report filed after the arrest, Batista indicated the robbery had occurred quote-unquote, on or about May 2nd, but Batista later told a detective that it happened on May 8th. Browder asked the officers why he was being charged and said, quote, I didn't do anything, end quote. A police officer told Browder he would be taken to the precinct and would likely be allowed to go home. Browder and his friend were taken to the 48th Precinct Police Station, where they were fingerprinted and kept in a holding cell for a few hours. They were taken to the Bronx County Criminal Court, where they were processed at the court central booking. The following day, Browder was charged with robbery, grand larceny, and assault. Since he was still on probation, Browder was not released. During his arraignment, he was charged with second-degree robbery, and bail was set at $3,000. The amount needed was $900 if the family used a bail bondsman. Browder's family could not raise this amount and borrowed money from a neighbor. When his family met with a bail bondsman to post his bail, they were told that since he was on probation from his prior felony conviction, his probation officer had placed a probation violation hold on him, so posting bail would not get him released from jail. He was taken to jail at Rikers Island to await trial and resolution of his pending probation violation. Preet Bharara, the United States Attorney for the Southern District of New York, said the Rikers had a, quote, deep-seated culture of violence, end quote, in which inmates suffered, quote, broken jaws, broken orbital bones, broken noses, long bone fractures, and lacerations requiring stitches, end quote. Browder said inmates washed their own clothes with soap and a metal bucket, causing rust stains on the clothes. Browder's mother began visiting him weekly and provided him with clean clothes and snack money. To avoid becoming a target of the inmates, he slept on top of his belongings, including his bucket. Browder said he felt pressure to gain physical strength to defend himself from carceral violence. He said, quote, every here and there, I did a couple pull-ups or push-ups. When I went in there, that's when I decided I needed to get big. 
end quote. In addition to fearing violence from other inmates, Browder also feared the correctional officers at Rikers. On one occasion, he and other inmates were lined up against a wall. Correction officers wanted to find the instigator of a fight. Browder and the inmates were punched one by one. He said, quote, their noses were leaking, their faces were bloody, their eyes were swollen, end quote. The guards threatened the inmates with solitary confinement if they reported their injuries. Browder continued to have a hard time within the walls of Rikers. On October 20th, 2010, a gang member spat in Browder's face. Later in the day, Browder punched the gang leader and was set upon by 15 gang members. On September 23rd, 2012, a video was recorded showing Browder in handcuffs being assaulted by guards. After a fight with an inmate, Browder was put in solitary confinement for two weeks. He later said of the other inmate, quote, he was throwing shoes at people. I told him to stop. I actually took his sneaker and I threw it and he got mad. He swung on me and we started fighting, end quote. Due to the constant fights, Browder spent nearly two years in solitary confinement. Browder's time in Rikers was due to the Bronx County District Attorney's Office constantly dragging out his case. They had a backlog of cases and repeatedly asked for more time. Even after submitting an affidavit of readiness, each week the prosecution asked for a delay in the proceedings. Browder maintained his innocence throughout and would not accept any plea bargain offered by the prosecution. On March 13, 2013, Browder appeared before Bronx judge Patricia Domingo. She offered Browder a plea bargain of immediate release for his admission of guilt to two misdemeanors with consideration of time already served. Browder refused the offer and was returned to Rikers. On May 29, 2013, Domingo freed Browder in anticipation of the dismissal of the charges against him. Batista had returned to Mexico and could not give testimony against Browder. After his release, Browder and his brother Hakeem sought legal representation. A family member found the Brooklyn prosecutor, Paul V. Prestia. In 2011, Prestia had represented a Haitian man who had been arrested in the Bronx and was wrongfully jailed for eight days. In November 2013, Browder filed a lawsuit against the New York City Police Department, the Bronx District Attorney's Office, and the Department of Corrections. Prestia claimed that there had been a malicious prosecution and that the court had been misled about the prosecution's readiness for trial. Prestia also put to the court that the prosecution knew they would have no witness when Batista returned to Mexico. The city of New York denied these allegations. The prosecution against him on unfounded charges, the violence of Rikers, and his time spent in solitary confinement had taken a toll on Browder's mental health. He said, quote, people tell me because I have this case against the city, I'm all right, but I'm not all right. I messed up. I know that I might see some money from this case, but that's not going to help me mentally. I'm mentally scarred right now. That's how I feel. There are certain things that changed about me and that might not change back, end quote. He added, quote, before I went to jail, I didn't know about a lot of stuff. And now I'm aware. I'm paranoid. I felt like I was robbed of my happiness, end quote. He had made several suicide attempts in the past. While incarcerated in 2010, Browder made his first suicide attempt. He tried a second time on February 8, 2012, trying to hang himself using strips of sheets tied to a ceiling lamp in the cell. Browder later said that correction officers goaded him to commit suicide. On another occasion, after an appearance before a judge, Browder made a sharp implement from the bucket in his cell and started to slit his wrist. An officer intervened in this case. In November 2013, Browder made another suicide attempt and was admitted to the psychiatric ward, the first of three admissions to the ward. On June 6, 2015, at 12.15 p.m., Browder hung himself from an air conditioning unit outside his bedroom window at his mother's house. Jenny, what do you think of this case? Heartbreaking and disgusting and so frustrating. It's one of those cases that, like, just makes you feel like nothing is ever going to change. 
It definitely highlights the issues within our justice system. Bail, what an issue that is for people. Prison conditions and the need for reform. And also the importance of mental health care for incarcerated people. I mean, in my ideal world, there would be less people in prison. But I think that everyone in prison, I think, should have access to mental health care. If he had had either proper like mental health care while he was incarcerated or, you know, if maybe there was like some follow-up care afterward, I mean, you know, maybe things would have turned out differently. But he was so scared of going back to jail that he would have rather died. What does that say about our system and how we view people who are or have been incarcerated? There's at least two videos of him being beaten up brutally in jail. And one of them is from a corrections officer. I think you just need to look at this case and it sums up the overhaul that we need with the United States prison and justice system. So I definitely agree that there has to be some sort of reform. And I think that this case, it really makes you think about the control that prosecutors have over people's lives. Because at the end of the day, he should have never been in Rikers for that long. There wasn't any really strong evidence keeping him there. And the only reason why he couldn't be bailed out was because of a BS probation violation that for whatever reason, they didn't resolve because the prosecutors kept dragging out the case, even saying that they were ready, but still asking for a continuance. And one instance is actually on his case file that every single week, prosecutors ask for a continuance. And it's like, how can you do that to people where you have someone in jail, a jail that you know is rotten, a jail that you know is dangerous, yet you still drag your feet keeping people in there. Like, I think it's just disgusting. And I think it's one of those things where you look at it and you're like, you're all at fault and you're all corrupt. The death of Khalif Browder stems from a multitude of factors. One thing is certain, Khalif's time at Rikers Island destroyed his mental health. And even once he was released, the damage was already a giant weight on him. As we said, Browder was held in solitary confinement for two years. This was in addition to the abuses that were perpetrated in the jail. Solitary confinement is a form of imprisonment. Solitary confinement is a form of imprisonment distinguished by living in single cells with little or no meaningful contact with other inmates. Strict measures to control contraband and the use of additional security measures and equipment. Beginning in the early 1970s, prison and jail administrators at the federal, state, and local level have relied increasingly on isolation and segregation to control men, women, and youth in their custody. In 1985, there were a handful of control units across the country. Today, more than 40 states have super maximum security or super max facilities primarily designed to hold people in long-term isolation. Prisoners are often confined for months or even years with some spending more than 25 years in segregated prison settings. As with the overall prison population, people of color are disproportionately represented in isolation units. Numerous studies have documented the harmful psychological effects of long-term solitary confinement, which can produce debilitating symptoms such as visual and auditory hallucinations, hypersensitivity to noise and touch, insomnia and paranoia, uncontrollable feelings of rage and fear, distortions of time and perception, increased risk of suicide, and post-traumatic stress disorder. These effects are magnified for two particularly vulnerable populations, juveniles whose brains are still developing and people with mental health issues who are estimated to make up one-third of all prisoners in isolation. Another issue in the broader case is the fact that the main reason why he was in jail was a probation violation for a crime he committed in his teens. Many people have their lives ruined because they are on probation. In Khalif's case, he was unable to be released from jail even when his family got the money due to his probationary status. Approximately 61% of convicted individuals are sentenced to probation. In 2002, there were over 3 million adults on probation in the United States and those numbers rise every year. Disadvantages of probation include the fear of community residents who believe convicted criminals should not be back on the streets because they might commit other crimes. 
Another concern about probation is how inconsistent probation sentences and probationary officers can be in their treatment of offenders. Some counties may send offenders to jail for the same crime where others are given probation. Similarly, probation officers may be very strict in one area and very lax in another. While one officer might report the failure to attend a therapy session as a probation violation, another might overlook the absence. The last element of this case we are going to discuss is false witness testimony. Khalif was arrested due to a combination of racial profiling and false witness testimony. His case is not unique and many exonerations happen after DNA evidence disproves eyewitness accounts. Mistaken eyewitness identifications contributed to approximately 69% of the more than 375 wrongful convictions in the United States overturned by post-conviction DNA evidence. The Innocence Project has stated, quote, Despite solid and growing proof of the inaccuracy of traditional eyewitnesses, ID procedures, and the availability of simple measures to reform them, traditional eyewitness identifications remain among the most commonly used and compelling evidence brought against criminal defendants. End quote. There are several ways eyewitness identification is tainted. In a standard lineup, the lineup administrator typically knows who the suspect is. Research shows that administrators often provide unintentional cues to the eyewitness about which person to pick from the lineup. In a standard lineup, the lineup administrator may not elicit or document a statement from a witness articulating their level of confidence in an identification made during the identification process. A witness's confidence can be particularly susceptible to influence by information provided to the witness after the identification process. Research shows that information provided to a witness after an identification suggesting that the witness selected the right person can dramatically, yet artificially, increase the witness's confidence in the identification. In a standard lineup, the lineup administrator may choose to compose a live or photo lineup where non-suspect fillers do not match the witness's description of the perpetrator or do not resemble the suspect. This can cause the suspect to stand out to a witness because of the composition of the lineup. This unintentional suggestion can lead an eyewitness to identify a particular individual in a photo array or lineup. To me, it's just like another thing that investigators can do to just get the results that they want. We've talked before about false confessions and this kind of reminds me of that. I think we've mentioned before too that eyewitness identifications are really not reliable. Our brains and our eyes aren't as reliable as we think they are. And like, I think that they can be helpful, like eyewitness statements, but I don't think that they should have so much weight as a lot of them do. And yeah, it just, it seems like another thing to just fit a narrative and it's very upsetting to hear about. I had no idea that there was kind of like not a psychology behind it, but I didn't know that they cue you subtly into thinking like, okay, that this person did it because this is the description. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. I think that the weight that is given to eyewitness testimony is definitely disproportional to their reliability. And I think that the more that we have forensic evidence becoming more advanced, I think that eyewitness testimony should definitely not be considered as strongly. That wraps up this week's case. Thank you for listening. Let us know in the comments what you think about Khalif Browder's case. You can read more about this case and how to support us in the links below. We will be back next week with a brand new episode focused on the Salem witch trials. As always, stay safe.